GLC is now offering a free audio stream of our 24-7 broadcast that we're calling GLC Radio, an online radio station that broadcasts our round-the-clock audio stream on a variety of platforms. GLC Radio gives you the ability to listen to GLC virtually anywhere, through your home or office computer, or on the go with a mobile device. You can access GLC Radio through our website or by searching for God's Learning Channel through iTunes Internet Radio, TuneInRadio.com, or on Shoutcast.com. Explore various GLC Radio-enabled mobile apps by visiting our website at glc.us.com forward slash listen forward slash GLC Radio. GLC Radio, your free connection to GLC anywhere, anytime. Well, welcome to this update. You're going to enjoy it because it's got some different Special things. stuff. Huh? Special stuff. Mm-hmm. Special stuff. One thing I want to start off with give you kind of a little report. Ryan, if you could put up our DMA map. Now, this, all those four colors, five colors, are the areas that the FCC has given us to be carried on cable systems. That's about what it amounts to. Okay? The, those are the market areas that our five full-power transmitters cover. Yeah, you can see. And also, you'll notice that we have on there the LPN Galaxy 19 satellite. Well, it's being fed by the LPN, and look at those little lines running out of GLC. We're the only broadcaster that's doing such a thing. But you know why we did it? We're going to save $215,000 a year off a of satellite. Fees. That's right. That's Hallelujah. And, uh, that's good news to the person who writes the bills or pays the bills. <laughs> pays yep. the bills. And you'll notice under each one of those, like New Mexico, it's a 54% complete. That means there's 54% of the cable system has been completed to Galaxy 19. In the conversion. In the conversion that we've been talking to you about for the last three months. And K- but that's only at KRPV. Yeah, and then KPTF is 65%. KPTV in Lubbock is 93%. And let me tell you why that one's so high. Suddenly, it's taken such a liking to GLC that is carrying it all over its major systems in West Texas. And that amazing. is marvelous. And many of you people in Amarillo and Lubbock have been writing to Suddenly, telling them thank you. You can't believe what a thank you means to a cable company. Mm-hmm. And so... Well, I'll tell people why. Can I tell people why please. real quick? It's because everybody knows that your cable bills went up well your cable bills went up in correspondence to the price that cable companies have to pay for arable programs okay so when you're writing to them and you're telling them wow we just love that glc station we really love that one it makes them really happy because they don't have to pay for us that's right that's right that's and right. they want, they need stations that the people love that they don't have to pay for. Mm-hmm. Of and, of course, you can look at the map itself. You notice down at the KMLM in the Odessa Midland area, we're down to 39.3% left. Uh, that's all that's been converted. But that's not you- a very good number. That means more than 60% of this local market area has not been converted yet. Yep. And a lot of that has to do with the funds that we didn't get to do it. Now we're going to convert one more system with the funds that you've sent in, which was uh, up in Border at Cable One. So all that area beginning. But my bottom line is, where did your finances go? Did you not want to support and get these things covered? And that, oh, let me add one thing to your thing about the letters, mm-hmm. writing the letters. We may lose some of the cable systems because of our conversion, but that didn't change the law of cable having to carry us when we provide Well, what do you signal. mean we might lose some of them then? They may not be converted if we don't get all these things converted by that. Oh, okay. If we, if we don't get the money in to convert them, we're not converting them. That's right. right. Okay. Well, you can't. You can't. If you don't have the money, you can't do it. No right. dinero, no easy. So, okay, so I'm going to tell everybody what's going on around here okay. because... I've been working on the newsletter. Hallelujah, we're finally getting a newsletter out. Hallelujah. With a uh, brand new schedule in it, and I just finished that schedule 
very late last night. So Karen has everything in hand. She's putting it together, and we'll finish working on it late tonight. She's not in this area. She's up in uh, Kansas. And then um, it'll go to the printer, and then we'll start hopefully stuffing next week to get that into your hands before October because it's the October newsletter. And uh, if you're not on our mailing list, you want to get on our mailing list because I'm telling you, I was struggling and struggling about what to write in the newsletter because we had such great feedback from the last newsletter. People are still asking for copies of that, and um, which is amazing to me. But I'll struggle and struggle, and then... Over the weekend, the Lord just dropped things into my spirit. He says, I want you to share this with them. I want you to share this with them. And so God, God has some pretty great messages for all of us. That's and right. uh, I think you're really going to love it. But you've got to be on our mail list, either the mailed out or our email, our e-blast, to get that. And we're also working on receipt letters. I've already got the receipt letter put together. I've just got to balance, and then we can start getting those out the door as well. Okay, so here's the thing. We're adding five programs to our lineup come October. One of those programs is a program out of Jerusalem with Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel and Rabbi Ari Abramowitz. Many of you uh, will remember my interview with Ari, or my visit, I should say, where I was astounded. Um, he was here, was it late November, early December? We went up there, and he was part of that award ceremony to your mother. That's right. That's right. But uh, December, Ari right? and Jeremy are tremendous men of God. They are tremendous they men really of God. Are. And they have been hosting a, uh, a program called Israel Inspired, a radio program, where it's an interview format, and they just interview a whole plethora of people. And they've been doing this for a few years, and, and I've been asking them to, like, set a camera in there and video this so that we can share this with our viewers. Well, they finally got it done. And so that program is going to be going into our lineup, which the October schedule is effective September the 27th. Okay, so what you're about to watch right now is Jeremy Gimpel. Now he's been here, but I've never hosted him. So it's been a few years since he's been here. And this is Jeremy's story. This was recorded by uh, Joshua and Caleb Waller over in Israel. And um, I hope you really love it. We'll be back right after you're done. Jeremy Gimpel, it is awesome to sit here in your home. I can tell you the view from his balcony is something that I think people <laughs> would pay millions for. And back home, and, and you know, we have the Smoky Mountains near us in Tennessee, but uh, this is absolutely, if I can use the word epic and not sound too, uh, <laughs> I don't know what's up there. Anywho, I want to go back to your story here because what is fascinating about you is your journey from where God has brought you and the steps that He's taken you now to be a show host, the voice of Israel, blasting it to the nations. But let's go back because I think the most important thing that we want to capture from you right now is your story. But let's go back to your dad, because it's a fascinating story. I heard you telling it to our group about a month or two ago, was just hearing the story about your dad. Somehow or another, did he, I guess he got to Israel first, and then he took a boat to America. And then he got there and didn't have any money hardly, and just said, okay, the cheapest college. And, and I mean, you finished the details for me. Go ahead and tell me the story. Um, so the way it began was really my grandfather walked from Russia to Israel when he was 15 years old in 1916. And uh, you know, he spent the first few years of his life draining the swamps of the north. And now you, know, you see the northern part of Israel. It's like the most beautiful place in Israel. And uh, my father was born in Jerusalem, went, you know, finished his high school, went to the IDF, served in the army for three years, and then his plan was to become a doctor. But his, the only uh, medical school, there was only one, was packed, and he didn't have the grades, too busy playing soccer. And, uh, well, he got on the last boat to leave Israel, ended up in New York, and uh, he had $500 in his pocket, and he said, well, I better find the cheapest college in America because I don't have any money. And he found that the cheapest college in America was a Baptist Bible college outside Alexandria, Louisiana. And uh, he got on a bus, ended up in a Baptist Bible college. And for a Jew to get on a boat from the land of Israel and end up in a Baptist Bible college outside Alexandria, Louisiana in 1960 was totally unheard of. But the Christians there loved my dad. 
And, you know, they helped him, they supported him, and they, like, said, like, you know, a Jew has come from the Holy Land to come and bless our institution. And they saw it as a blessing. And uh, my, my dad, you know, worked and worked and worked, and, you know, it's just like a workhorse. The guy didn't know English. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to get into medical school in America either. And uh, he was putting in, you know, 20-hour days sometimes. And uh, one Saturday night, they invited him out to a, a football game. And my dad said, football, you know, I love football. I've played football my whole life. The reason why I'm here in Louisiana is because I was so busy playing football. Because in Hebrew, of course, Kadu Regel is football translated, but really that's soccer. And so he went to the football stadium expecting to see a soccer game. And what he sees is these, you know, big husky Americans killing each other on the field. <laughs> and my dad's like, well, what did America do to soccer? And, uh, you know, he pays close attention to the game. And they saw that at one point they kicked this egg-shaped ball through this big H. And uh, my dad said, well, what is that? I could do that. So what are you talking about? So listen, I've been playing my football my whole life. I can kick that little egg through that big age. And he said, well, could you show us? And he said, well, sure. So they put the ball on the 20-yard line. And if you look at old football clips, you know, they used to kick the ball straight on with, like, sawed-off toes. And my dad, you know, stood at an angle and swung at it like a soccer ball like they do today. And the ball went right through. And they you know, they were shocked. And all through the whole long story happened, but my father was one of the first people to introduce European soccer-style kicking to American football. He got a full football scholarship to Oklahoma University Medical School. Somehow he became a doctor and then um, got an internship in Atlanta. And then, of course, I was born in Atlanta. Wow. But the plan was, you know, become a doctor, get your license, move back to Israel and heal the sick. But, um, you know, life in Atlanta was marvelous for my family. You know, it, had a beautiful house and a wonderful car, and then my dad got a, a, you know, a raise in his salary, and then he got a nicer car, and then he got another house, and then, you know, just life just drew us in. And uh, 20 years, my family lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was in 91 when Saddam Hussein started dropping Scud missiles on Israel that my two older brothers, Daniel and Micah, were in New York University, dropped out of school, and moved to Israel. And my parents were like, it's literally as Scud missiles were landing, my brother's plane landed. And uh, after the war sort of calmed down that summer, I was 11 years old at the time in 1991. My parents said, well, our vision was to finally move back to Israel. Here, our two oldest are already there. Maybe it's time that we make it home. And so at 11 years old, we left Atlanta, and we've been in Israel ever since. But the reason why I tell that story, and it's important to like note, my grandfather started off his journey to Israel as a secular Zionist. He came from an Orthodox Torah observant home. And he became a secular Zionist, you know, hard to keep kosher as you walk for a year and a half trying to get to Israel. And he was so young, he just didn't have the wherewithal to, uh, you know, to stay true to the Torah's command. And uh, really, he was running away from Russia, running away from anti-Semitism, running away from what would be the Holocaust just a few years later. Um, but my family that came back in 1991, by that time, we weren't secular Zionists, we were religious Zionists. And we weren't running away from Atlanta, we were running to Israel. And those two movements, those two returns to Israel, are almost exact opposites. And that now is the movement of Israel today. It's not a movement out of fear, it's a movement out of courage. And it's not a secular movement, but it's very much a religious spiritual movement. That's amazing. Uh, the religious spiritual movement is what really, you know, everybody we talk to, it's like this huge, major connection. It's a faith connection. To Israel, and that's what it's amazing to see that that's what that it's exactly what brought your family uh, back to Israel was that faith uh, that brought you directly. And where did you move to when you came back? I think that's a really yeah. We moved directly to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, yeah. See, I knew it. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we, I went to you know middle school, high school, and I served in the army. And um, you know, when you talk about the religious connection to Israel, you know, for two thousand years, religion for us was very personal. It was between our own connection to God, our own observance of commandments, and our own uh, prayers. In 1948, religion changed, and it brought us back to the national redemption, that there is a destiny that's unfolding here in the land of Israel. It's not just about my own personal redemption or my own salvation, but God's plan for humanity is unfolding in Israel. And the question that everyone is challenged with today is if God's plan is unfolding in Jerusalem, what is my place in God's plan? How can I play the biggest part? How can I be the best character in this story that's unfolding? And so the words of the prophets of Israel that we held on to for thousands of years with just faith. In my grandfather's time, there was no Israel. In 1914, 
there were 60,000 Jews that lived in Israel. In 2014, there are over 6 million. In just 100 years, to go from 60,000 to 6 million is unprecedented growth. An explosion of holiness is now being revealed in the land of Israel. God's plan is unfolding, meaning the train has left the station. Right. Nothing is going to stop this. Mm -hmm. And so now the question everyone has is, how can they be a part of it? Well, how does it make you feel to be a part of this, this huge restoration? You, you got here when you're eight years old. Pretty much your whole life has My whole been life. just um, wrapped up in this huge restoration that's happening. You know, it's, it's like a whirlwind because it seems as though the world is coming to a place now where Israel is going to have to take leadership over the world. We're going to have to lead the way as America sort of losing its place. It's, um, it's taken God out of the schools. It's taken the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse. It's removing God from every sphere of public life. But society can't live without religion. Society can't live just as animals amongst other animals. It is the God within us that makes us human. Everything around us, all the animals are living beings. We're human beings. We were created in the image of God. Once we take the image of God out of us, then society will fall apart. And so we have now on one hand America, which is removing God from everywhere that it possibly can. And on the other hand, we have ISIS, which is using their God um, to wage war. And so there needs to be one pillar of leadership, one light in the world that shows, no, the ways of God are ways of peace. The ways of God are the way of love. And Israel is becoming every single year more and more spiritual. And that too is a prophecy in Ezekiel. It says that the Jews that come back, they'll need a new heart. They'll have a heart of stone. They'll be re replaced with a heart of flesh. God will pour his spirit out upon the people of Israel in order that they will walk in his ways and follow his commandments. Meaning in Ezekiel's vision, first the people that come back will be secular, kind of like my grandfather. But as the generations pass, God's spirit will move them to reconnect to who they really are. And every single year you can see in Israel a spiritual awakening that's happening. So it's sort of like I'm not just watching this story unfold, but I'm sort of a player in the story, helping mold it and shape it and build, raising my family here. Um, you know, growing up in Atlanta, English was my mother tongue. And to see an ancient language that was lost for 3,000 years, my children now speak that holy tongue as their mother tongue. It's like a miracle in the making. That's amazing. Jeremy, can you tell us about your military days? Sure. Um, well, I finished high school. I was 18 years old. And I didn't want to just go into the military directly after high school. So I spent two years in a yeshiva, in a seminary, where we studied Jewish philosophy, Torah, the Bible, Jewish law, um, really focused for two years entirely in the spiritual. Because I wanted to go into the army um, as a leader, as a light. And uh, I wanted to become an officer. And so I was lucky enough that after nine months, I was promoted to be a class commander. And then from there, I was sent off to officer's training class. And uh, we served in the Givati Brigade Infantry. And um, you know, I went into the Army in August of 2000. September of 2000, the Antifada went, broke out. And so my entire service was in the Gaza Strip. And it was you know, jarring, because we used to see tires burning, Molotov cocktails being thrown on CNN, and now they're throwing it at me. <laughs> and now I'm like a player in this new game of being a Jewish soldier. And it dawned on me that the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, is the first Jewish army organized, sovereign in the land of Israel since the times of King David. We have resurrected David's army, and we're now fighting the forces of evil. Literally. I know people don't like, they don't feel comfortable saying that. But when you see what um, the neighbors around us are doing to each other, um, they're turning churches in Syria and Iraq into torture chambers. It's hard for us to imagine, but Christians are being crucified in Syria now. And here there is this one country that accepts people that's vision is to create a house of prayer for all nations to worship God. Um, and we're, we're battling for freedom. We're battling for the only free society in the Middle East. I think it's incredible. You're, you're not only a soldier on the front lines of advocacy in Israel, but you're also that physical soldier that's, that's fighting the lines. You were just in Gaza. You were just fighting. And uh, I just think that's, that's a, a, an amazing thing. There's not too many people in the world that have uh, both fronts, and, and you're standing on both of those, that, that advocacy 
uh, front, and that's really what I, what I want to talk about now. You're fighting on that, on that war front, but then you've got this other battle going on that you have engaged in in a real strong way. Uh, can you talk about what you're doing now in your life of advocacy and moving forward in that direction? Sure. Um, you know, the last war in Gaza um, was overwhelming uh, spiritually for me personally. I was, you know, called up uh, into the army. I had eight hours to arrive at the emergency pickup spot. Thousands of rockets were raining on Israel. And uh, we were called up to defend the innocent civilians of Israel. And at the time when I was watching the news, I was injured in that war. And um, once I was discharged, I was watching the news coverage. And on one hand, they would have an Israeli spokesman, and then on the other hand, they would have a Hamas spokesman. And I said, has America, the BBC, CNN, have they lost their mind? How could it be? Imagine if after 9-11, they went to the President of the United States, and then on the other side, they wanted to talk to Osama bin Laden to hear his side of the story of 9-11. There's no side to his story. We were being shot with rockets. We're defending ourselves. Where has the world gone wrong? And so now we've established Voice of Israel which is a news broadcasting network from Jerusalem to tell the story as it really is happening from our perspective. That those that really want to hear the true story of Israel, there's an address now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's to bring the truth out of Israel to the world. You know, there's a prophecy in the second chapter of Isaiah and the fourth chapter of Micah that says, the Torah shall go forth from Zion and the word of God from Jerusalem. You always wonder, well, how is that ever gonna happen? Is someone gonna have a really loud voice? And just as the Jews returned to the land of Israel, the internet was brought to the world. And now from Jerusalem, the Torah can go forth from Zion and the truth from Jerusalem. And so that's the vision that we have is, you know, we're surrounded by tyranny and oppression. And that tyranny and oppression isn't satisfied with its own. It wants to take over Europe and it will ultimately make its way to America. And so there needs to be a voice waking the world up. And so. I think that's what Voice of Israel is, and that's our ultimate job. How long have you been doing stuff like this? Like, you've been involved for, for a number oh, of years. Oh, goodness. Well, here. the first radio show we hosted was about over 10 years ago. That evolved into a television called, show called Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem, and now Voice of Israel's been established. So we've been involved in spreading the truth about Israel for well over 10 years now. <laughs> and uh, this, is, uh, this is our chance. This is our chance. Um, a lot of Jews in the time of the early Zionist movement they said, well, what would we do if we go to Israel? In the 1900s, Israel was a backwatered, swamp-infested desert away from the world. We're meant to be a light unto the nations. How, if we all move to Israel into the middle of the Middle East, how will we affect America? How will we affect you? How will we do our mission? Little did they know that it's specifically from Israel being a light as a society, how we deal with the Hamas, how we deal with this threat of terror, how we are living as a democratic society that's continually growing in our spirituality. We are a light to the world, and the whole world now, through the power of telecommunications, television, and the internet, have the chance to see the light from Zion. Darren, there's so many fronts you're on. I'm just sitting here thinking, like, we could go so many directions. But you were involved in so many different things throughout your, your life, and, and really right in the present. Last elections, you ran for Knesset. Yes. Uh, what was that experience? Um, the experience was phenomenal. It really was. It was awesome. Uh, we were traveling around Israel. Um, you know, in, in Israel, our faith is so interconnected. It's so holistic. You know, for a Jew living in America, you know, he's an American. He's a Yankees fan. He likes going shopping, and he's also a Jew. In Israel, your Judaism is expressed in in everything around you. The, the place that you live is expressed by your faith. The party that you vote for is expressed by your faith. So running around Israel, um, spreading the ideology that we believe in as religious Zionists, and sort of reminding people that we've made Aliyah, we've ascended to Israel, but now we have to keep on making Aliyah. We have to continue this ascent towards the final goal. The establishment of the state of Israel is the very beginning of the process. And now the goal is to establish a kingdom of God in the land of Israel. What that would look like, a kingdom of peace, of harmony, of godliness in the world. That's awesome. We've talked a lot about all your, all the things you've, you've done and, and what you're involved in now. I want to hear like on a real basic level, uh, back to the family, what's your family like? 
What do, what do you, what, how many children do you have? So it's interesting, uh, I, I live in sort of two worlds, where on one hand, my mind is consumed with God, Israel, the destiny of the Jewish people, biblical destiny unfolding, the nations of the world that are standing against us, those that are standing with us, prophecy un unraveling. And so that's like very big vision. And then the rest of my life is very, very little vision. It's uh, entirely focused on my children. Um, the stories of the Bible, you know, we said, well, it's a law, the Torah. It's the laws of how to walk in God's ways, the same way that there are physical laws of gravity. There are spiritual laws of how God wants us to live, to respect our parents, to get married, to build a home, uh, to sanctify certain times. Um, ultimately, those laws were given to us through stories. And all those stories are stories of families, Adam and Eve, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their children, and their wives, and their families. All of the stories of Israel were given through us through the prism of family. So it's important that we live with very large visions of the destiny that's unfolding in Israel. It all will ultimately boil back to raising really solid families, loving your wife and making sure she loves you, and raising up the next generation of Israelites in the land of Israel is my ultimate goal. Everything that I do outside of Israel in many ways is just to set an example for my children that they should know this is what a Jewish man should do with his life. He should be dedicated not to his own self, but to the higher self, to the self that's beyond, to transcend your own independence, to live for something that's beyond you. That's the ultimate service of God. Now I'm going to take this a step further. Obviously, you're talking about your children and your family, but what are your dreams? What is, as you're sitting on the couch or as you're sitting out on your front porch here, what are your dreams of this place or your family or your, the, the nation of Israel? Or like, what do you see in the future? You know, right outside my house here, there's a dirt road that literally passes right underneath my, my balcony here. It's called the Root of the Patriarchs. And it dates back to the time of the patriarchs. And, you know, right in the middle of the book of Genesis, Abraham is called from Beersheba to take Isaac as a sacrifice to Jerusalem. And this was the major highway from south of Jerusalem to Jerusalem, where they walked right along this pathway here. And since then, for thousands of years, all of the Jews that lived south of Jerusalem, this was the highway that they walked on to arrive at the temple three times a year. And on the road, you'll see ancient ritual baths, ritual mikvahs that were built as they're to purify themselves on their way up to Jerusalem. To see my children today playing on the root of the patriarchs, where Abraham and Isaac walked, is the dream. The dream is already here. Now, we just have to make it flourish. We've returned to the mountains of Judea. How? It's mentioned over 40 times in the Bible. It's the most prophesied event in all of Scripture, the ingathering of the exiles. And here, in just my community, we have Jews from Ethiopia, Russia, America, South America, all over Europe, South Africa, Australia. We've been gathered from the four corners of the earth back to the mountains of Judea against all odds. So the dream now is to raise marvelous families, beautiful children that will fight for what's right in the world, that will fight for peace, that will fight for democracy, that will fight for people's rights, that will see the poor and reach out and help them. I mean, why is tzedakah such an important mitzvah in the Torah? Why is giving charity so fundamental? Because if we are to be just for ourselves, then what's the difference between us and a horse? It's what makes us human that allows us to give of ourselves. So I would love for my children to live a life where they're living beyond themselves and living for the higher causes of life. That would be my dream. I think that that is like one of the greatest stories ever, ever, ever. The only way that we can top that is by sharing with you on Light of the Southwest tonight, which is going to start in about 30 minutes, a teaching that Jeremy did up at Hagiovel a few months ago on the book of Ezra. And I'm telling you, it is going to blow you away. You don't want to miss it. The second hour will be, follow, will be uh, Joshua Waller, who you just saw interview Jeremy when he was here a couple of months ago. We love you, and we will see you on Friday. Yeah.